Hello everyone, this is Professor Roman, and this is the first lecture in the second part of my series, Abstract Algebra, A Comprehensive Introduction. This is the course on group theory. There will be, ultimately, I hope, four parts to this Abstract Algebra series. The first part is Linear Algebra, and that is completed. Each part consists of a textbook together with accompanying YouTube video lectures. The lectures follow the textbook very closely, but there will be additional topics in the textbook that are not covered in the lecture series. Volume 2 of this series is group theory. That's this course we're talking about now. Uh, subsequently, there'll be volume three, which is ring and field theory, and volume four, which is order and lattices. The textbooks uh, for linear algebra and group theory are available now on my website, www.sroman.com. If you've been following any of my YouTube lectures, you might know there are, I have two other courses posted. Uh, the first is an introduction to category theory. There are only six lectures there. It's just introductory lectures. The textbook that accompanies those lectures is more comprehensive than the lecture series, and that's available on my website. The other course is a transition to advanced mathematics. I recently did a revision of that course, so the lectures that are posted there are, are um, based on my uh, transition course that I taught at the University of California, Irvine, in the summer of 2021. And the textbook is revised. The original uh, book was really just a set of notes. The new book is a complete textbook with exercises. So all that material is on the website as well and on YouTube. So I want to talk uh, briefly first about the series itself. The four volumes uh, are independent of each other and as far as prerequisites, um, the ring and field theory lecture series does require some knowledge of linear algebra and group theory. But it doesn't have to come from my other courses. It can come from any source. Otherwise, the four volumes in the series will start pretty much from the beginning with no expectation that you've already studied the material. As the title of the series suggests, this series is a comprehensive introduction to abstract algebra. And by introduction, I mean that the books start more or less from the beginning, assuming no prior knowledge of the subject at hand. So the only prerequisites for the series are uh, an understanding of basic mathematical tools that you would find in a typical transition course, such things as induction and uh, equivalence relations and partitions and the like. Also, I'm going to assume that you've had some exposure to linear algebra, something on the order of the freshman sophomore course that's taught at most universities. I hope you've had a little bit of exposure to vector spaces, at least the definition of a vector space and a basis and maybe linear transformations. I realize that this will be, for many of you, a first exposure to rigorous abstract mathematics, and so I've tried to write the discussion and the proofs with an eye towards uh, some motivation of the, of the material. I think most textbooks tend to prefer conciseness and elegance, you might say, over uh, motivation, seeing the motivation behind the construction of proofs and so on. And so I've tried to give you some of that motivation without 
doing it, uh, being excessive in that. Uh, and I hope that will uh, will work for you. By comprehensive, I mean that the books in the series include a somewhat wider range of topics than is typical for upper division undergraduate courses. The, this series is aimed at serious undergraduate students and beginning graduate students. <clears throat> so I've, I've tried to include enough material <clears throat> so that when you finish the course you have a very solid grounding in abstract algebra and you are ready to attack more advanced treatments with an advantage perhaps over students who have taken uh, more restricted courses. I should also mention, as I did for the linear algebra course, that <clears throat> while the trend in mathematical education has been for some time to motivate abstract mathematics with applications, and I certainly understand and respect the reasons for that, <clears throat> I've chosen to take a more abstract approach to the subject. I'm a pure mathematician, not an applied mathematician, and so I appreciate mathematics as an art form worthy of study in its own right, as well as a cornerstone for science technology. So my approach is more abstract. If you're looking for a course in applied abstract algebra, this is perhaps not the course for you. <clears throat> As to this particular volume, the group theory volume, um, <clears throat> I have written the textbook primarily with the idea that it can be used in a classroom setting, in a physical classroom, not just for an online course. Uh, and in particular, that means there are time constraints that all instructors have to abide, whether it be a 10-week uh, quarter course or a 15-week semester course. Uh, I've always had to make hard choices as to what to cover and what not to cover oftentimes been disappointed that I couldn't cover certain topics because there simply wasn't time. Uh, so I've tried to arrange this textbook uh, so that instructors can use it in a classroom setting. So several topics are marked as optional. Uh, here is a list which I will not read because if you haven't studied group theory it won't make much sense to you. What I did do is post on my website the front matter for this book as well as the linear algebra book. So you can see the preface to the series, the preface to each volume, the table of contents for each volume to give you a sense of whether this material is something that would be of interest to you. Um, <clears throat> so I won't go into the organization of the book chapter by chapter because, again, if you haven't studied group theory, it won't uh, be of terrible uh, significance to you at this point. But there are a couple things I do want to mention. First, as far as background for this uh, group theory course, there are two appendices in the book. Appendix A contains background information, uh, the kind of material you would find in a transition course, multi-sets, although I, I talk about multi-sets in my course, other people probably don't. Also, uh, equivalence relations, partitions, and things like that. The second appendix, Appendix B, is a brief but rather important introduction of partially ordered sets, lattices, and intersection structures. Uh, the Appendices taken together is only about 15 pages, so if you have the book, I would urge you to read the appendices before you start the course. Uh, on the other hand, 
the linear algebra series uh, does cover this material. The first, well, the first lecture in the linear algebra series is an introduction to that course, which is not directly relevant. But lectures two, three, four, and five are background material, both for the linear algebra sequence and for this group theory sequence. So uh, I urge you to look at those four lectures before beginning this course. The lecture four is on cardinality. That's the least important of the background lectures. But lectures two, three, and five, uh, I, I would urge you to look at those at least. Now, again, that's from the linear algebra course on YouTube. Chapter 1 of this book is also something I should comment on. This is a little bit different than you'll find in other textbooks. It's more about context than actual mathematics. The aim here is to give you an overview of abstract algebra. So if you haven't studied any abstract algebra other than linear algebra, uh, this will give you some context and uh, the approach is to examine some customary paths that everyone takes in studying abstract structures, algebraic structures, uh, such as groups or vector spaces. By describing several common themes that are encountered in the study of abstract algebra. So, for example, <clears throat> substructures. Groups have their subgroups, rings have their subrings, fields have their subfields, lattices have their sublattices, and vector spaces have their subspaces. That, that one you probably already are familiar with. But the concept of a substructure is common to uh, most of the algebraic structures. Quotient structures is another common theme. <clears throat> groups have their quotient groups, rings have their quotient rings or factor rings. Fields don't have quotient structures. Lattices do, and vector spaces do have quotient spaces. So that's another common theme. Structure-preserving maps is a very important common theme. Groups have their homomorphisms, which are structure-preserving maps. Vector spaces have linear transformations. Those are the structure-preserving maps for vector spaces. Rings have structure-preserving maps. Fields do. Lattices do. So <clears throat> it occurred to me that rather than wait until you've studied groups, rings, and fields, let's say, and then recognize that there were these common themes, it would make some sense to discuss them now before you embark on a study of these structures. It might have been worth doing it in the linear algebra course, but I decided to wait because I think there will be uh, people who are interested in linear algebra for reasons other than their interest in abstract algebra, so they may not take group theory, ring theory, or field theory, just linear algebra. So I'm doing it here. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do, and what I will, what I have done in the lecture series in the book, is place the discussion in the context of an arbitrary algebraic structure that I call a widget. So widgets could be groups, they could be vector spaces, rings, fields, whatever and then take a look at these common themes, the three I mentioned and some others, in the context of widget theory. And that will give you a, an overview of these structures so that as we begin the study of group theory, you will say, oh, I recognize that as a common theme. And I think that's very useful. Um, strictly speaking, you could skip this chapter and the lectures associated with it if you wanted to, but I, I, I have had some feedback from students, from readers, 
uh, who generally find this to be useful material. So that's why I'm going to go through it. Um, so I guess we're ready then to begin, in the next lecture we'll begin the subject, we'll begin the introductory material, we'll begin the discussion of what is abstract algebra and um, what are the common themes that run through abstract algebra.